Friends, welcome. It's good to be together. I know that it's been a challenging couple of days. I guess that some aren't able to be with us because they are dealing with downed trees and flooded basements and this kind of thing, but it's so good to be able to be together. And for those joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. This is such an important day for us as we turn our mind together to Calvary, to the hill upon which our Savior gave his life for our redemption. And as we turn our mind to the hill of Calvary, we turn our eyes to the pages of Scripture, and we're in Mark's Gospel today and this weekend, and I'd invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 15, where I'm going to read for us verses 33 to 39, and I'd invite you to follow with me. This is page 853 if you'd like to use one of the church Bibles, Mark chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray together as we begin. God, our Father, as we come to this very sacred text, to your word and to this key passage which speaks of the event which is at the heart of your saving plan, as we consider the suffering of our Savior and the redemption that he achieved for us at Calvary, we pray that you would quieten our hearts and open our eyes by your spirit that we might see what is here in the pages of your word, that with the eyes of faith we would look to Calvary and we would marvel afresh at our Savior and what he achieved for us there. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we turn together to this familiar but foreboding passage of Scripture, as we come to the Mount of Crucifixion and to the foot of the cross, as we remember once more what our Savior did for us there, it is as though we are standing together upon very holy ground. These are sacred events that we've come together today to remember and to consider. And and it is right, I think, that we should have a sense of quiet and of awe amongst ourselves. We've come in, haven't we, from a busy world. And for some of us, we have come in from a very chaotic week. Our minds are full of all that has taken place in recent days. Our, our minds are full, no doubt, of all kinds of burdens and interests and of tasks and concerns. But, but for these moments together, we, we set those aside and we cast our minds back 2,000 years in history to this extraordinary scene where the Son of God, God incarnate, submitted himself to the very worst of human injustice and cruelty that he might bear our guilt and purchase our salvation. Mark, in his brief but profound account, wants to confront us afresh with the reality of these events and point us afresh to their true meaning and their true significance. There are riches of detail and of symbol within his account, and we need to, we need to see these together together. And then we need to allow their meaning through the help of the Holy Spirit to sink deep into our hearts. Through his recounting of the events of the crucifixion, through the details that he records for us here in these few verses, Mark is essentially driving home to us one essential truth. And I'd like to summarize that truth and that I want to reflect carefully and I trust reverently upon it together. Here, I think, is a faithful summary of the core truth that Mark unfolds for us in these verses. He is showing us that in the crucifixion, we come to understand 
that Jesus was forsaken that we might be accepted. Jesus was forsaken. Jesus, the Son of God, the divine Son, the sinless one, he was forsaken by the Father in this moment that we might be accepted by the Father, that we, the sinful ones, the guilty ones, the ones worthy of the punishment, that we might be welcomed with open arms. That's the simple message of these verses. And I want to look at its two parts. First, that Jesus was forsaken. Jesus, the Son of God, was forsaken. The scene that Mark paints for us as he recounts these events, it begins with a very dramatic darkness. You will have noticed darkness when there should have been light. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Under the system of reckoning time here, the hours are counted from 6 a.m., so the sixth hour is noon, and the ninth hour, 3 p.m. This wasn't, you know, Stockholm in winter. This is not the north of Scotland in January, when it might be pretty dark, even in mid-afternoon. This is Jerusalem. This is lunchtime. This is early afternoon, and darkness in this place at this time of day, it's not something normal or typical or usual. This is an extraordinary darkness. This week here in Ottawa, of course, we've had our own experience of relative darkness during the day, this time because of a powerful storm. And whenever the sky grows dark midday, it's an unsettling thing, isn't it? It's, it's foreboding. It's even frightening. But the darkness that came over Jerusalem on the day that Jesus died, it wasn't a storm. It wasn't localized or regional cloud cover. It was a profound darkness over the whole land, a sweeping, unusual, remarkable darkness. And like everything else in this scene, it bears tremendous meaning. Profound darkness over the whole land is something that had been seen before in Scripture, of course. Remember that this is the time of the Passover in Jerusalem. This is the time when the events of the Exodus, the deliverance of God, of his people from Egypt, these events were remembered and were celebrated. And to free his ancient people from bondage at that time, you'll remember that God sent 10 different plagues on the land of Egypt, one of which was the plague of darkness. He sent an unusual, a profound darkness upon the land as a sign of his judgment against Egypt for its sin against him and through the for the mistreatment of his people. Well, here again, the profound darkness, the miraculous darkness, it is a sign of divine judgment for sin, of divine displeasure. It's over the whole land, Mark tells us. And there is, of course, guilt throughout the land. But this judgment, it is falling upon just one person. Mark, when he, when he observes this, he doesn't then take us on a tour of the whole land like sometimes a newscast might take us by helicopter or drone to see a scene of devastation, to survey a wide scene. No, there is darkness across Israel, across Judah, but our focus, it is on one man hanging upon one cross in the very midst of this dark scene. As we give thought to the darkness, our our attention is grabbed now, not by a sight, but by a a sound, the sound of Jesus' own voice, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some ways, these are the most shocking words ever spoken, ever heard. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he has lived in perfect fellowship with the Father for all eternity past, since before the creation of the world, since before any human being ever existed. He has enjoyed perfect fellowship with the Father within the Godhead. And now as God incarnate, as the man Christ Jesus, he hangs upon this cross and he sees in the darkness that is over him a clear indication of the judgment of God that is coming upon him in a very personal way. He recognizes that in his humanity, as he bears the sins of his fellow human beings, he is now facing an experience that is entirely new to him as the Son of God, entirely foreign. He is experiencing forsakenness. He is experiencing judgment. He is experiencing the weight of divine displeasure even at his father's hand. It's 
speaking these words, which are recorded for us first in Aramaic, which is the language Jesus likely spoke, spoke most naturally, and then in Greek translation for Mark's readers. In speaking these words, Jesus is actually quoting now from a psalm, from Psalm 22, which speaks prophetically of his suffering. Actually, it speaks in great detail of the sufferings of the Christ. It speaks of a, a sufferer who faces unjust torment at the hands of his enemies, enemies who pierce his hands and his feet. The detail there in the psalm is remarkable but who entrusts himself to God and sees beyond his suffering to a time when he will call together a congregation of spiritual brothers and sisters to join him in praising the Lord. That's the story of the psalm. And, and this particular psalm, which Jesus quotes, is part of the Old Testament's prophetic picture of how God is going to bring redemption to his people. It stands alongside another well-known passage like Isaiah 53 and its portrait of the suffering servant, if you remember that. God is going to send a righteous and innocent deliverer who will suffer unjustly, who will face a death that he does not deserve, who will bring salvation to many. That's the promise of the Old Testament. That's the expectation. Well, Jesus here, he quotes the opening line of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in his anguished cry of the psalmist's words, he is actually making a profound declaration. He is declaring that he is the promised sufferer of Psalm 22, who suffers unjustly, who cries out to the Lord, and who ultimately draws others into relationship with God through his anguish. So there is confidence, there is hope, there is intentionality in this cry, this scene of darkness. It's heading somewhere wonderful, but Jesus knows what this moment means. It means facing the very judgment of God. He knows why he is doing it. He knows why the deep shadow of the Father's displeasure with sin has come upon him. It has come upon him because he is bearing the darkness and ugliness of human sin in the place of sinners. He has taken upon himself the guilt of others, though he is innocent, and he is bearing in himself the righteous anger of God. You know, the Bible is so clear. The Bible is so clear about this. Our sin, our rebellion is offensive to our holy God. He cannot tolerate our sin in his holiness. He will not abide our sin in his justice. A holy and just God must judge sin, must address sin. And at the cross of Christ, sin is being addressed fully. Judgment is falling. The price is being paid. But it is being paid by the guiltless one, by the innocent one, by the righteous one, the one who willingly took my place and your place as he hung upon that cross in that place of bleakness and forsakenness. Some around Jesus have mocked and mistreated him in the midst of his suffering, and the offer of sour wine, of which we read, it's hardly a kindness to him. It's actually all part of the agony and the indignity of his suffering, part of the picture the psalmist had painted so many centuries before. But ultimately, Jesus' agony now ends in the culmination of judgment. It ends in death, verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. This is a starkly brief and simple statement, but consider it for a moment with me. Allow it to sink in. The Son of God, the Prince of heaven above, he has taken on frail flesh and submitted himself to death at the hands of the people whom he himself had made, even upon a cross of wood, wood hewn from trees which he had created. He has cried in pain and breathed his last, and he has done so to receive from his hand from, from the Father's hand, rather, the judgment of sin. Death is God's appointed judgment for sin. It's what he promised the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden right at the beginning. If they rebelled, if they disobeyed, death is only part of our experience in this world because of sin. And it is the dark reality, isn't it, that hangs over every day of life on this earth. It's why we find birthdays and anniversaries bittersweet. It's one more year, so it's actually one less year one year closer to the grave. It's why every relationship of love and of friendship has lurking somewhere in the background an edge of sadness to it, an edge of fear, 
even of pain, because we know that the grave will mean separation and loss. And the reality of death and the prospect of death, it haunts us and it, it hurts us. But at the cross, in the scene that is unfolding before our very eyes here, Jesus goes there for us. At the cross, he draws the sting and he bears the pain of death so that he might absorb the Father's judgment in our place and so that death might not be the end for us anymore. But now we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Mark wants us to see that at the cross, Jesus was forsaken. He faced the judgment of God forsakenness, and he did so that you and I might be accepted. Jesus was forsaken that we might be accepted. As Jesus hangs upon the cross on Calvary's hill, as he takes his last breath, at that moment something takes place a little distance away in the temple. Something took place within the temple precincts which showed immediately the profound effect and implication of this saving act of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Notice it with me, verse 38. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, at first glance, this seems to us a rather strange report, a rather extraneous piece of information. We're at, we're, we're at the cross. We're thinking about the death of Jesus. Our focus is, is firmly there, and rightly so, and suddenly we are transported across town to the temple, to the holy place, to the, to the great curtain that separated off the, the holy place from the, the most holy place. And of course, the significance of the, of the great curtain was to demonstrate that there is a barrier between a sinful people and a holy God. Access to the holy place and then to the most holy place is hugely restricted. Only the high priest, only once a year, only with the appropriate sacrifice, goes all the way into the most holy place. You see, sin has this most extraordinary way of breaking relationships, of separating us and isolating us. We see it, we see it in human relationships all the time. You'll know all about that. Warm fellowship, real bonds of love. They're strained and they're torn and they are ripped apart by sin. We, we see that, don't we? But the most profound effect of sin is actually to separate us from the God who had made us, from, from the God who loves us, for, for the, from the God who created us for rich and joyful relationship with himself. And as we rebel against him and as we spurn his kindness and as we reject his word, we're cut off from him. That's what sin does. The relationship is broken. A, a wall, a barrier goes up. That's why Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, barred from the very presence of God. And the temple of old in Jerusalem was in many respects a giant visual aid showing just how much separation there is between a holy God and a sinful people. How hard it is for a people defiled by sin to gain access to the presence of God. The, the temple was constructed really with a series of barriers, uh, courtyards, walls, and then curtains. And here is the curtain into the inner sanctuary, the barrier that closes off the place of God's very presence. And as Jesus dies upon the cross, as he breathes his last, that great curtain is torn in two from top to bottom, indicating that God himself is opening it. And the point is clear. The point is not coded. It's not mysterious. It's not hidden. We can't miss it. The point is this. There is now access to the presence of God available through Jesus and his saving work. The barrier is removed. Relationship is offered once more. Now, the barrier can be broken down because the price of sin has been paid. Justice has been satisfied. All that a holy God requires for sin to be dealt with, it has been accomplished. Now, now, again, this is a truth for us to savor today of all days. I think, I think we all know very well the sense of feeling distant from God, uh, unfit for his presence because of our sin. If we have any sensitivity to the Lord and to his holiness, any understanding of his word, we will know this feeling. We'll all know something of that. But for us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, here is the wonder of Good Friday. The way has been opened to us. There's no barrier between us and the Father. We are welcome in His presence, not because we've done no wrong. We cannot pretend to be sinless, 
not because we're worthy, we, we cannot imagine that in and of ourselves we are, but simply because Jesus has paid the price owed by us and has died the death that we deserve. And so we come to the Father welcomed and accepted. I've referred to this before some time ago, but I, I find quite charming uh, a series of photographs that were taken of JFK uh, with his small children in the Oval Office. I don't know if you've ever seen those. I gather these were actually taken when the First Lady wasn't around. I understand she didn't really like the children being photographed or featured in that way. But these children playing at the feet of the leader of the free world, hiding under the desk and so on, in the room which represented the pinnacle of global power, free access, a, a welcome, a, a place of belonging. It's quite a lovely scene. If in some respects the Oval Office is the room of most prized and restricted access in our world today, if, if it was in the time of JFK, then surely the most holy place in the temple, the, the inner sanctuary, that was the room of most prized and restricted access in Israel and in the ancient world. And here is the point. Because Jesus was rejected upon the cross, you and I are welcome in the presence of a holy God. The point is underlined, and the, the welcome is emphasized in what comes next, verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Centurion was, of course, a Roman, one of the enemy occupiers of the land of Israel. He would have been a Gentile, a spiritual and an ethnic outsider. And added to that, he was, he was there. He was involved. He was implicated in the death of Jesus here is a true outsider to the things of Israel, to the things of God. And we might think, especially on this day, the day of crucifixion, an outsider to the things of Jesus Christ. Here is an outsider. But of all people who observe the death of Jesus on this day, he appears to be given a special degree of understanding and insight. As he observes Jesus drawing his final breath, he makes a profound declaration. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, the centurion, he didn't have any special claim to the God of Israel. We presume he didn't have any background in the teaching of the Scriptures or in the promises of God, but he saw in Jesus Christ as he died something very remarkable, and God gave him grace to respond to him with the remarkable declaration that we find upon his lips. The crowds have abandoned Jesus the religious leaders have condemned him. Even his disciples have deserted him in large measure in his hour of need. But this Roman centurion who was assigned the task of overseeing his death, he sees and believes something. In some measure, he makes a personal response to Jesus Christ. We don't know the degree of his understanding. We don't know the full spiritual nature of his response, but it is a meaningful response that much must be said. It's a significant moment. That much is very clear. And Mark wants to show us something important through it. The fact that Jesus has been forsaken at the cross, it has opened the way to God. It's opened the way into his presence. Note the curtain. And it's opened the way for the religious and the spiritual outsider to come in. You see, Mark doesn't linger in the temple when the curtain is torn in two. He doesn't show us a long line of priests and religious people trooping into the newly opened Holy of Holies. That's not what happens. That's not where we go. He takes us back to the hill of Calvary, and he takes us to a Gentile who is an enemy of Jesus, participating in his murder, and he shows us that this man, as he responds to Jesus, as he recognizes Jesus, he has a true opportunity to come in. In a sense, the centurion represents most profoundly and most wonderfully the opportunity for anyone to respond to Jesus Christ and to come to the Father through the Son. And friends, that is the wonder. That is the wonder of the gospel that we remember today and that we give thanks for today. You and I, we, we were outsiders. We were outcasts. We were rejected. And Jesus he faced our rejection that we might be accepted, that we might be welcomed, that we might come in. And if we belong to him by faith, if our trust is in him, we're welcome in the presence 
of the Father, not, not because we're worthy, not because our lives are in good order, not because we've made it in any way, but simply because Jesus has paid this very, very great price for us to purchase our access to the Father. That's the wonder of Good Friday. It's what we remember today. And if it happens that you're one today who feels an outsider to the things of God, if it happens that you are today an outsider to the things of God, you know you are, but you'd, you'd love to come in, actually. You'd love to know him. You'd love to be made right with him. You'd love to have a relationship with the God who made you, to be assured that he will welcome you into his eternal presence when this life is past. If that's you, let me say this as we close. The way is simple. The way is simple. The way in is through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross, which we remember today. It's by admitting that you deserve rejection before God. It's by thanking Jesus that he faced that rejection for you. It's by joining the centurion in confessing that surely this man was and is the very Son of God. And for you, like each of us, there is full forgiveness. There is pardon. There is access. There is a welcome, even in the very presence of God. There is a welcome with the Father because his own Son was forsaken for us that first Good Friday. Friends, as we marvel in this truth, let me invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you once again for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly accepted the pain and agony of which we read in this passage, who hung upon that cross in our place, who was forsaken that we might be accepted. Make the wonder of that real to us in a fresh way. And for any who have not yet taken hold of what the Lord Jesus accomplished that first Good Friday, for any among us, we pray, Lord, that this might be a day of salvation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.